the uh, theme for today, Leap of Faith. It reminds me of ridiculous, foolish stunts I attempted while trying to break into the Hollywood music scene. Thank you for having me here. Now, <laughs> they're la they're, you're heckling me already. That's okay. That's all right. I, I, I can handle that. Technically, I'm not your dad. But I hope that I can give you some fatherly advice as you ponder the possibilities of your own leap of faith moments. Here are some words to remember. Get out of the pile. Right now, you're all students. Together, like a herd. It's a lot of love. I can feel it. It's nice. But at some point, this morphs into friendly competition. And each one of you will have to figure out a way to separate yourself from the rest. Having a four plus GPA, it's nice. But it is not a guarantee of success out there where it's not always a strict meritocracy. Me, I was pretty successful out there. But as my actual kids like to remind me, I'm not that smart. <laughs> and it was not my talent that after a number of spectacular failures and embarrassing <coughs> lessons eventually led to earning the title composer for those 75 primetime network TV series, including Seinfeld. You don't land that many composer gigs by being just good at music, Sakamano. For one thing, I was a pretty good closer. I knew how to close a deal. I had to, because I had no family in Hollywood to help me, and I'm not pretty. Even a little kid, not that cute. But that little kid had superpowers. Music. It was a little strange for me as a little kid, being the music kid, there were no musicians or artists of any kind in my family. Still, they were supportive. I got great music training. Formal conservatories, private lessons, college classes and ensembles, any place that I could learn and play music was my happy place. Plus, as a child, I was convinced that the songs on the radio were narrating each experience of my life, like a Walter Mitty soundtrack. In those lyrics, I found answers to my overwhelming questions of youth. And those songwriters, they were my heroes. My hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, at the time was kind of a small pond, which was an advantage for me because without a lot of competition at a young age, I was able to acquire much valuable professional experience as a musician. Before I could drive, I was working in the hotels, restaurants, jazz clubs. I did classical concerts. I worked as a musical director for the local opera and theater companies. I produced local recording artists. It was a really cool way to spend my teens. Folks around town, they knew me. I grew a reputation. It could have been a really happy choice for me to remain like that spend my life as a local musician. Then I turned 17. You know how when Harry Potter turned 17, things changed. 
he had to leave. Me too. Those songs on the radio that used to narrate my life, they started sending me messages. They started steering me west, enticing me to California. At first, the seduction was subtle. But then, it became blatant. My music worlds started colliding. Herbie Hancock, who was my teen jazz crush, he played on a record with Stevie Wonder, two of my heroes together in California. Same was true with Ramsey Lewis and Earth, Wind and Fire, Michael McDonald and the Doobies, Joe Walsh and the Eagles. <laughs> the gravitational pull to join that party was hard to resist, especially with Steven Tyler constantly singing in my ear to dream on. Like Harry Potter was drawn, drawn to Hogwarts, I was being summoned to California. So in 1976, at the age of 17, I left my family and my home. And I took that big, scary leap of faith to Los Angeles, where nobody knew me. I had plenty of skills, mad music skills, good experience, excellent training. So as soon as I got there, I started working freelance. And for the next 10 years, Studios kept me busy as a for hire Swiss Army multi purpose utility tool for musical chores. Any job that remotely smelled like music and needed doing, I did it. I worked long hours because I was young and I didn't need to sleep. And the folks in the music department offices, they knew me and they respected my abilities, they had confidence in my professionalism, and they kept me working. And I was grateful to be able to do all those odd jobs. It was like on-the-job training for what came next. I made a lot of money doing that, too. I owned two houses full of music equipment and recording gear, had a big, nice, healthy investment portfolio, but it was not a well-managed career. The telephone every day dictated to me where to go, what to do when I get there. I had no control whatsoever over the direction of my own career. And long term, no idea where it was headed. My problem was this. I had no business plan. I'm still technically not your dad, but listen up. Each one of you, right now, as students, should have a business plan for yourself. Business plan must be concise and clear, must have a primary goal, so that you can prioritize your choices toward the goal. Must be practical, sustainable, flexible enough so that if the landscape changes or you have surprise opportunities, you're flexible enough to take advantage of those changes. Most importantly, your business plan needs to be in writing. You need to commit to this business plan. Read it out loud to another human. Put it in a place in physical form where you'll see it every day. In that way, it will inform your decisions toward your primary goal. Once I did that, once I created and committed to my business plan, I knew exactly what to do. That was the good news. Bad news, it required that I risk everything. It was my next big leap of faith. I sold all my possessions, both houses, all the gear, my investments. I took the money, and on my 28th birthday in 1986, 
I bought a commercial building in Burbank, California, right on Burbank Boulevard in the heart of Studio District. What I really wanted was for someone to pay me good money to compose excellent music in a beautiful space using only the latest bleeding edge technology and working with LA's finest studio musicians and singers. Since that job was not in sight, I created it for myself in that building. I read books, lots of books, business books, how to start a company, how to manage employees, small business best practices, entrepreneurial principles. I also read books about the music business, intellectual properties, copyright, contractual rights, publishing, licensing, royalties, consent decrees, PROs, all of these business tools that I was going to need to run a successful company and complete my business plan. Now, my target clients were the producers of primetime major network episodic TV series. It was pretty specific since there were, at the time, only three networks. My business sales strategy was simple. Get out of the pile. There were a lot of composers in LA. Good ones. Scary how good my competition was. I did not want to have to, every day, compete just based on our music superpowers. So I checked, where are the piles? How can I get out of those piles? I'll tell you about a couple of them. One, this was pre-internet. The way that the top level composers got their jobs was through their agents. The most powerful Hollywood music agents represented the top tier composers. Their roster of names, very intimidating to me, but it looked like a pile. No agent for me. I knew that that was going to exclude me from certain jobs, but at the same time, it gave me a very sharp sales tool that I used often to separate me from the other composers to get out of the pile. Here's how it worked. I would meet with a producer and say, I know you're considering these composers right here for the job besides me. Nothing but respect. These are fine composers. But which 15% of your music do you not want? These folks have agents. Before they write the first note of music, the agent takes its commission off the top of your music budget. That's so sad. Shake this hand right here. You get 100% of me, and as a bonus, you don't have to deal with yet another Hollywood agent. And sometimes it worked. Help me out. Sometimes it worked. Yeah. <laughs> it worked well enough that I got a few assignments. Most of my early assignments were terrible shows that were canceled within their first season. It was like the Kevorkian network TV. I was afraid the network execs were going to have me whacked just to stop me from doing more. If you look at my credits from those early years, except for Married with Children and Who's the Boss. It was like a death list of obscure failed show titles. But that's OK. It was a start. I was beginning my career. What had happened was, once I, my building was ready and my company was started, I had actually written letters to each of those people who, for those 10 years, had been kind and generous and supportive to me and had hired me for their musical odd jobs. And the letter said, by the way, this is a letter with an envelope and a stamp, because there was no email. 
the letter said, thank you for having faith in my abilities and confidence in my professionalism. Thank you for trusting me with those music assignments. Now, stop that. I am a composer. Here's my new company. Let's do business. And I held my breath. I may have just nuked my whole career, thinking about the last 10 years of my life, scorched earth. But when those letters began arriving at their destination all over Hollywood, people shrugged and said, gee, that's too bad. He was a good utility guy. OK. And they started, little by little, throwing me composing and songwriting assignments. And with my business plan taped to my desktop, my career as a composer began. I declared myself a composer. You can't declare yourself a dentist. People frown. But I declared myself. And as soon as I knew what I wanted, who I was, and I told the world they recognized that. And they allowed me to be a composer. Still, I was trying to get out of the pile. There was also creative piles. In the 80s, theme music was melodic, a lot of silly lyrics and sassy saxophones. Guilty. I created a lot of that kind of music. But so did a bunch of other composers. It was a pile that I needed to get out of. So as soon as I realized that, at the next producer's meeting, I said, now I know you're considering these other composers for this job. And they are excellent. If all you want is good music, hire one of these folks. I do something much different. For you, I will create a sonic brand, an earworm so special, so unique, that it will serve as an instantly identifiable signature for your show. People from another room with their head in the refrigerator will hear it in the Pavlovian response. Ooh, let's watch. And sometimes, it giddy up. It certainly worked with Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry called me. He told me that the be opening for his new series was Jerry standing in front of a bunch of people like this. They laughed, and he wanted theme music. I said to Jerry, I don't think you want music. That's a recipe for a, an audio conflict, because we need to hear your voice. How about this? We make your voice telling jokes like the melody. My job will be to accompany you in a way that does not interfere with the melody. Every time you do a different monologue, it's a variation on the theme. The organic nature of your human voice telling jokes will blend well with the human nature of my human mouth, lips, tongue, finger snaps, like this. And I had his attention. A slap bass had not yet enjoyed celebrity status as a solo instrument. At the time, it was buried as an element of funk music. The bass line I wrote, so simple, so basic, so sophomoric, that it did not even require a meter to hold water. It could start and stop anytime I wanted to, to make allowance for the timings of Jerry's jokes and the length of the whole monologue. So each monologue, for each one, I created, I architected using those elements in a manipulatable, modular way, a separate recording of the Seinfeld theme every episode. Sometimes it, it worked. My career progressed. I got a few more hit shows, and my win-loss ratio improved. By the mid-90s, I was flavor of the month. That lasted 10 years. You don't get 75 shows by doing them one at a time. All of those work jobs, those assignments, I would be doing 10 series a week. It was really good for business, but not good for my home life. 
my wife and I, we were having way too many kids. <laughs> and they needed me more than Hollywood needed more of my music. So my wife and I decided, I'm going to retire. This was in the year 2000, and we said five years. So I told everyone, all the people I work for, all the people that work for me, we got five years. And I kept working for those five years, and I did more new shows, and I still had shows coming back, healthy hit shows on the air when 2005 arrived. So it was a little bit sad to say goodbye to shows like Reba. Loved working for Reba McIntyre. But she understood, and she wished me well. Same with Will and Grace which continued using my theme in my music in the episodes, and they still do. But in 2005, at the age of 46, I retired. We went into a Hollywood Witness Relocation Protection Program. <laughs> went back to Kentucky, where I became a full-time stay-at-home dad, PTA room parent, field trip chaperone, sports coach volunteer, and it was really good about creating new music, it was somebody else's turn. That's my story for today. I'm still technically not your dad, but I wish for you success avoiding the piles. And I hope that when it's your opportunity that you will believe in yourself enough to take your own leap of faith.